Let's say you build a website. Before you start, you need to set up a few tools to make your life easier. But which tools should you set up? The JavaScript ecosystem is changing so fast that it can be overwhelming to pick the best tool for you. There's even a name for this phenomenon. It's called JavaScript fatigue. You get tired even before you start. To solve this, in this tutorial, I'm going to walk you through how to set up a front-end project from scratch. We are going to cover what are the must-have editor extensions that you should have, how to find the right JavaScript libraries and how to add them to your project. We are going to clear up why you are going to use Node.js even if you want to do front-end development, and we set up an application bundler that will generate a live preview as you code in your browser. In the last part of the tutorial, we also go through how to set up a React and a Vue.js project from scratch in an easy way. Before we start, I would like to say thank you again for reaching the 1000 subscribers milestone. You are amazing folks. And if you haven't done so, please subscribe for more content and check out my earlier videos on JavaScript game development and other creative projects. A thousand people can be wrong, right? Let's start with the foundations. As a developer, you mostly edit text, so you need a good editor. So which one you should use? Picking an editor is highly based on personal preference, as most editors have very similar features. You can pick VS Code, Atom, Sublime Text, or even Notepad if you want, though the later won't make your life much easier. If you don't have a personal preference though, I'd highly recommend VS Code. Why? Because lately, VS Code became the de facto standard editor for web development. Here's a chart from the latest edition of the State of JavaScript survey. In this survey, more than 23,000 developers were asked about their preferences regarding web development. The vast majority picked VS Code. If you haven't checked out the State of JS survey before, I highly recommend giving it a look. It can give you a great overview of the latest trends with JavaScript. You can learn which tools and libraries people love to use, and which ones will they abandon soon. If you feel overwhelmed with all the changes in the JavaScript ecosystem, then the result of this survey can be a great guide. Now back to the editor. One of the greatest features of all the mainstream editors is that you can add extensions to them. Let's walk through two extensions that are must-haves. Prettier is an extension that makes your code more readable and more consistent. Let's say you copy-pasted something from Stack Overflow and it's hard to read. The tabulation is off, a line is too long, and so on. Then you just have to save the file and bam, everything is as it should be. This is what Prettier does. It formats the code based on best practices. It doesn't just fix tabulation and wrap the lines, it also adds parentheses to improve code readability, make sure that you're consistent with quotation marks, and many more. To make it work, first you have to install the Prettier extension. In VS Code, go to the Extensions panel, search for Prettier, then install it. Installing the extension doesn't format your files automatically on save by default. The default behavior is that once you install the extension, you can right-click within a file, then select Format Document, or select part of the file, then select Format Selection. The first time you do this, you need to select a default formatter. Actually, VS Code already has a default formatter. It just isn't as powerful as Prettier. So now that we have two, we have to set that in the future, when it comes to formatting, we want to use Prettier. If you want to auto-format your files on save, you need to change a setting. Go to the settings in your VS Code Preferences and search for Format and Save option. By default, this is false, so make sure that you tick the checkbox. After that, every time you save a file, formatting should happen automatically. Formatting can be controversial though. In most cases, especially for beginners, I highly recommend the default settings. But if you prefer a different style, you can customize things. If you only have one line where you want to keep things as you wrote them, then you can indicate that with a comment. For instance, if you want to make sure that this array doesn't get turned into this, then you can write prettier ignore as a comment before it and it will stay as it is. 
If you have more generic problems with PDRs formatting, then you can create an RC file where you can list your preferences. This configuration needs to have a specific name and needs to be in the root folder of your project. So let's create a JSON file called .prettyrc and add a few options. A typical option could be if you prefer single quotes instead of double quotes in your files, or if you don't want to have semicolons at the end of your lines. With this configuration, once you save your files, you should see a different output. There are many more options, of course. If you want to dig deeper, just Google Prettier Config and you will see many more options. But if you're a beginner, then again, you should probably stick with the defaults. Before we get to the second must-have extension, we need to set up a few other things. First, we need to talk about Node.js. What is Node, and why do you need it even if you work as a front-end developer? Node is often associated with back-end development, but that's not entirely true. If you see a job description where they are looking for a Node developer, then probably they indeed look for a back-end developer. Yet you are going to use Node even if you are a front-end developer. So what is Node and why do people think that it's for back-end development and why do you need it even as a front-end developer? Node is a JavaScript runtime. It runs JavaScript files outside of a browser. There are two ways of running JavaScript code. You either have it as part of a website and run the entire website in a browser or you run only the JavaScript file with Node. Let me show it to you. We have a very simple JavaScript file here that prints hello world to the console. That's it, only one line. Now if we have a node installed, we can go to the terminal and run this file with node like this. You can see that the file was executed and the result is on the console. That's what node really is, a tool that runs JavaScript files on their own. JavaScript mostly behaves the same way in both cases, but there are also differences in what JavaScript can do in a browser and when it runs with Node. For instance, when running in the browsers, JavaScript can access the HTML elements and it can even modify them. That's the main point of having JavaScript in the first place. In Node, there's no surrounding HTML file. JavaScript runs on its own. On the other hand, in Node, JavaScript can access your file system and read and write your files. Why is it interesting? For instance, you can run scripts on your machine that generates a project skeleton for you, or that runs some checks on your files and corrects the mistakes, or runs your test files. In short, Node lets you run some tools that make your life much easier as a developer. We get there in a second, but first let's install Node to your computer. Maybe you already have it. To check this, go to your terminal and type node-v. If it gives you a version number, you already have Node. If you don't, then go to nodejs.org and install the latest stable version labeled as LTS. Then once the installation has finished, you can go back to your terminal and double check that Node is installed. So to answer your question, why do people associate Node with backend development? Because if the backend code is written in JavaScript, the servers need to run it somehow on their own without the browser. So yes, if you're a backend developer using JavaScript, you're going to use Node. But Node is much more than that. Up next, we're going to see how can you use Node to install a bundler and how to add libraries to your project. Now that we have Node installed, we can install a bundler. What is a bundler? A bundler is a tool that takes all your files and turns them into a neat package that you will be able to run in the browser. Why wouldn't you be able to run your files in the browser? If you use plain HTML, CSS and JavaScript files, then you're right, you might not even need a bundler. But the web development tools have evolved, and the moment you're using anything more advanced, your browser won't understand your files. Are you using React? Do you see the fancy JSX syntax that looks like HTML? Well, that's not part of the JavaScript syntax. You need a tool to turn this into plain JavaScript, otherwise this won't run in your browser. Are you using SCSS or some other fancy CSS dialect? Guess what, you have to turn this into plain CSS so the browser can understand it. Are you using the JavaScript module system? 
Spoiler, you will. Another reason you want to use a bundler is that you can generate a live preview of your website as you're coding. Anytime you save a file, you see the result right away in your browser. So how to pick a bundler? There are several options. Currently, the most used bundler is Webpack. Webpack is a very powerful tool with plenty of configuration options. The plenty of configuration options are also its weakness. Setting it up is not an easy thing if you are new to it. Another great option that recently gained popularity is Parcel. Parcel has similar features as Webpack. In some way, it's even better. The great thing about it is once you install it, it needs zero configuration. Parcel automatically figures out what you're using and interprets them accordingly. Are you using React? No problem. Parcel recognizes that and interprets JSX. Are you using SCSS? No problem. Parcel knows what to do. To install Parcel, you need to run a command in your terminal. We are going to use npm or node package manager to install it. npm is a tool that comes with node. You can install JavaScript libraries with it on your computer globally or specifically for a project. We are going to discuss it in a bit more detail in the next step, but for now, let's just quickly install Parcel. Go to your terminal and run npm install dash g parcel bundler. The dash g here means global. So once you install Parcel on your computer, you can use it to run any project you have. You don't have to install Parcel for each project you create, you just do it once. After installing Parcel globally, let's see how can we use it to run a project. Here we have a very simple website where we use JavaScript to show the time. There's an HTML file where there's a header with an ID time and the script and style tag. In the CSS file, we add some very basic styling and in the JavaScript file, we change the content of the header to be the time. It's very basic and we only use pure HTML, CSS and JavaScript, which means we can simply run this in a browser. Just right click on the HTML file and select open in the browser. This works, but it's not live. Once you change a file, the browser won't refresh. You have to manually refresh the browser window every time we change a file. So instead of running it like that, we can use Parcel to create a live preview for us. Open the terminal and make sure that you're in the folder where your project is. If you're using VS Code, you can use the built-in terminal that will automatically start in the right folder. Once we made sure that we are in the correct folder, we can run parcel index.html. This will give you a URL where you can see the results. And anytime we change a file, we can see the result on save live in the browser. Once you start a script, it will run and generate a live preview of your site till you stop it or you close the terminal window. In general, you can keep it running while you're developing your site. Then once you've finished, you can press Ctrl C to stop it. If it gets desynchronized or you break it with an error, then you can also restart it by pressing Ctrl C to stop it, then run the same script again. So that's how you run a project with Parcel. Of course, Parcel is much more than that. Now instead of playing CSS, you can also use SCSS for instance. This allows you to use many cool features like nesting declarations, using mixins, or calling functions. It's like a CSS with superpowers. Or you can even replace HTML to use Pug instead. Pug is a more condensed way of writing your markup. This one certainly can't run in the browser, but with Parcel, no problem. Now that we have Node installed, and we had a sneak preview of how to use npm to install packages, Let's see how can we add libraries to our project. Let's say you want to use React to build your website. You are going to use npm. You want to add some 3D graphics and you need to use 3JS? Guess what? You are going to use npm. In the past, developers were using a CDN for the same purpose. You might import a library by having a script tag in your HTML pointing to a URL. 
That is fine and it still works well. But developers nowadays use NPM or Node Package Manager to add libraries to their project. Technically, NPM doesn't mean Node Package Manager, but everyone calls it Node Package Manager anyways. So how does it work? First, let's initialize the project with npm init dash dash yes in your terminal. Again, you need to run this command in the root directory of your project. I'm using VS Code's build-in terminal to start in the right folder. This command initialized a package.json file in your root with some metadata. At this point, this file is not that interesting. It has things like project name, description, version number, and so on. It gets more interesting when you start adding libraries to your project. If you followed my channel, probably you saw my JavaScript game tutorials that use 3.js to render 3D games. So how do we add and use 3.js in our project? Go to your terminal again, make sure that you're in the correct folder, and run npm install tree. This will install 3.js. But how do you know the keyword is tree here and not tree.js? When you don't know the package name, you can just Google npm and the name of the library you need. This time we know we want to use tree.js. But even if we wouldn't, we could also just search for npm 3D library and see what Google comes up with. It lists several packages. We can go through these one by one and pick one based on their capabilities and other infos. This list also contains 3.js, and let's say that's the one we pick in the end. These packages mostly come with a description and quick examples to give you an idea what the library can do for you. Another indicator you might want to look out for is the weekly downloads and the time of the last update to make sure that you select an actively maintained library that people still use. If you found the package you're looking for, you can see the command to install it at the top right corner, npm i3. The i here is just a shorthand for install. The other way to find out how to install 3.js is to go to its official documentation and check the installation guide. This will also tell you to use npm install. Here it also adds a save flag. The save flag is a legacy for old versions of Node. If you just install Node, you won't need that. This installation guide also gives you a hint on how to use 3.js in your JavaScript file with the import statement. We will check it in a minute. So back in the editor. When we run this command, three things happen. First, it will add the latest version of 3.js to your package.json file as a project dependency. Then it also creates a package log file. Both of these things, the dependency section of your package.json file and the package log file are things that you should never ever edit manually. For adding, removing or updating packages, you always use commands like npm install, npm uninstall and so on. The third thing that's going to happen once you run the npm install command is that a node modules folder gets created. This is the folder where the actual source code of 3.js will be. So when you import 3.js in your project, it will look it up in this folder. This folder is again something that you never ever want to change. You can look into it if you're interested in the source code of the library you are using, but you shouldn't change it. So now that we installed 3.js, we can create a very simple website that displays a 3D box. It's a simple HTML file again and a JavaScript file with the code for the 3D box. The key here is that in your JavaScript file, you import 3.js with the import statement, just like you saw it in the installation guide. And that will use the package that you just installed. Then you can run your project with parcel. Using imports means that we are using the module system now. Running a project with the module syntax can be a bit tricky, but we are using parcel to run our project and it works seamlessly without any questions. That's one of the reasons we use parcel. If you want to learn more about building 3D games with 3.js, check out my earlier tutorials on how to build a stack building game or how to build a traffic run game. Up next, let's see the second must-have extension for the editor. The second must-have extension is ESLint. 
While Prettier was formatting the code, ESLint can give you coding tips. There are several patterns in JavaScript that can cause a bug or can be misleading when you try to understand the code. Can you spot the bug here? This is a simple example where you declare a variable, but then you have a typo and you try to use another variable that does not exist. ESLint will highlight this for you. It will give you a warning both at the variable declaration, saying that you created a variable that you don't use, and at the point of usage where it will say that you tried to use a variable that is not declared. After these warnings, it's easy to spot that you made a typo. ESLint, of course, is much more complex than just catching this simple error. There are also less obvious ones where you might not understand first why does it complain. Then you can also click the link in the pop-up to see a more detailed explanation of why this pattern is considered harmful and what can you do to avoid it. So how can you use ESLint in your project? It's a bit more complicated because it requires a few more steps than installing an extension. Luckily, most of these steps you only have to do once. First, as you did with Prettier, you have to install the ESLint extension. Go to Extensions, search for ESLint, and install it. Then you also need to generate an ESLint configuration. Before you do that though, first you need to make sure that your project is initialized with npm in it. If you don't already have a package.json file, then first you have to run npm init dash dash yes to initialize your project. Then you can generate an ESLint config with npx ESLint dash dash init. npx is another tool that comes with Node. It can run scripts that are not even on your computer. In this case, we run the ESLint script, but we never actually installed ESLint. We installed an ESLint extension to our editor, but that's not the script we are executing here. So in short, npx can run scripts that are not even on your computer. This script will ask a few questions. Most of these are obvious, except the first one. Do you want ESLint to only check for syntax issues, or you want it to find possible problems as well, or you even want it to check for stylistic issues? If you use Prettier as well, you need to select the second option, because if both Prettier and ESLint try to recommend styling for you, they likely end up in a conflict. So if you use Prettier, you don't want ESLint to check for style, only for syntax and possible problems. Then it asks what sort of modules you use. Here you probably use imports and exports, so you select the first option. Then it asks if you're using React or Vue.js. For now, I just select no, but in a second, we will see how to set up a React and a Vue.js project. Then it will ask if you're using TypeScript. TypeScript is another amazing tool that I might cover in another video, but we don't use it for now, so just press enter for no. Then it will ask if your project is supposed to run in a browser or with Node. Here we set up a front-end project, so we select Browser. In the next step, it will ask you what file format you want to save your configuration in. This doesn't really matter, but probably you want to pick either JavaScript or JSON. Then finally, it asks if you should install ESLint as a development dependency to your project. Here you should select yes. This will install ESLint, so it will be available in your node modules folder. After this step, you will have your config, and you can find ESLint in your package.json file as a development dependency. Development dependencies means that ESLint is not part of your website's source code, but the tooling requires it. In this case, the ESLint extension requires that the ESLint package is installed to your project. Now that we have the ESLint extension installed, have an ESLint configuration, and we have the ESLint package installed, we also need to enable that the extension has access to this package. This is a security requirement you only have to do once. At the bottom of the editor, once you install the extension, you will find the ESLint button with a cross circle in front of it. Click that and select Allow Everywhere. This allows the ESLint extension to work properly for any future projects as well. 
After all these steps, ESLint finally should work. If we go to our JavaScript file and try to use an undeclared variable, then on save it will highlight the issue. ESLint only gets triggered on save. Before that, it assumes that you might fix the issue as you type. ESLint might also give you errors at places where things are actually alright. If you selected that the ESLint config should be in a JavaScript file, then it will give you an error for an unknown variable. This is because we said that the environment for our project is the browser, and in the browser there's no global variable called module. This file is not exactly part of our website though. It is a configuration file that won't be part of your final source code, and its natural environment is Node.js. And in Node, as you might expect, there is a global variable called module. So this file is actually correct, and there shouldn't be an error here. One way to fix that is to also add node as a potential environment in this config. Note that on save, the error disappears and also the file gets formatted. The later is pretty worth doing. It removed the unnecessary quotation marks in the object. The other way of fixing this is to set a list of files that ESLint should ignore. In the root folder of the application, you can create a file called .eslintignore and add .eslintrc.js to it. Once we save this, eslint won't run any checks on the config file anymore. Another thing that might happen is that eslint is giving you an error in your HTML files. This might not happen to you, but in case it does, just add another line in the eslintignore file. You can use a wildcard to ignore all the HTML files like this. ESLint is also highly customizable, but we won't get to the details in this video. For more details, check out the documentation of ESLint. Now that we went through all these tools, let's do a recap as we start a project in React. The first prerequisite we already did is that we have Node on our computer. If you still did not install Node.js, then just go to nodejs.org and install the latest stable version. The second prerequisite is having Parcel installed globally. If you don't already install Parcel, run npm install -g parcel bundler. The third prerequisite is to install Prettier and ESLint extensions to your editor. Also make sure that you give access to the ESLint extension at the bottom right corner to your node module files. All these prerequisites only need to set up once per computer. Now let's create a new project. Open the editor and under Explorer, click Open Folder. Then we create a new folder and open this new empty folder. Then go to the terminal and initialize the project with npm init yes. This will create a package.json file. Then we install the necessary dependencies, React and React DOM. You can install these two packages in one command or with two separate ones. First installing React with npm install React, then React DOM by running npm install React DOM. This will add React and React DOM to our dependencies in our package.json file and install them locally. Then we initialize the eslint config with mpx eslint in it. We go through the same steps as before, except this time we select react when asked. Then we also add the eslintignore file, where we said that the HTML files and the eslint config should be ignored. Then we can start working on our React app. We create an HTML file, that for now we'll only have a div tag with an ID. This is the tag where we are going to inject our React app. Then we also add a script tag pointing to the main JavaScript file. Then we create a file for the app component. This is a simple component where we can increase and decrease a counter. And it also imports a file with some basic CSS. Then we finally add the main JavaScript file that glues the HTML file and our components together. Here we import both React and React DOM plus our newly defined component. 
Then we use React DOM to replace the content of our div in HTML with our component. And that's it. That's how you can start a React project. Now you can start it with parcel in your terminal by running parcel index.html. And you can keep on developing your website. In this tutorial, I won't go any further with React development, but if you want to learn React, I highly recommend checking my earlier video on React and Vue.js. In this video, we go through the foundations of React and Vue in 20 minutes. There's also another way to set up a React project. If you don't want to build up everything from scratch, you can run a utility script that will generate an app skeleton for you. To run it, go to your terminal and type npx create react app and give it a name. This will create a whole project in a newly created folder with the same name as is set for your project. This will even include a basic test file, but it doesn't include ESLint config, for instance. This version also doesn't use parcel, but uses its own bundler under the hood, so you have to run npm start to see it in your browser. This way is rather the official way. Things in the JavaScript ecosystem are always changing though. With parcel simplicity and ease of use, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future the official recommendation would also be to use parcel, especially as it's a generic tool that you can use for all kinds of projects. We can also set up a Vue.js project in a very similar way. Now let's see how can we start a Vue.js project. We have to do essentially the same steps. We need to have Node and Parcel installed, and we're going to use the Prettier and the ESLint extensions. Here we also need a third extension though. If we use Vue's special file format, we need the V2 extension in order to display it properly in our editor. So if you're going to build a view project, make sure you have the VTour extension. Now let's create a new project the same way as before. We initialize the project with npm init yes and install view with npm install view. Then set up ESLint config, this time selecting view when asked. Then we have an HTML file that can actually be the same as we had before. We need an HTML tag that has an ID we are going to access and the script tag. Then we create a .view file for our component. This contains the component script, style and template. We create the same counter application we did before with React, except that now the style is also part of this file. Then finally, we have the main JavaScript file that will render a component within our div in HTML. Then again, you can run this by running parcel index.html once the terminal points to the correct folder. Here we won't get into the details of Vue.js development either, but again, check out my earlier video to get the basics of Vue.js. Similar to React, Vue.js also has its own utility to generate a project. This one you can use in two steps though. First you have to install the Vue CLI as a global dependency, just like we installed Parcel. Then you can create a Vue project with Vue Create and give it a project name. This tool will also ask a few questions and generate a skeleton based on your answers. Again, it's up to you if you want to use this way to generate a project or you want to build it up from scratch with Parcel. Now that we set up a front-end project, you are ready to start building your website. What happens though once you finish it? You need to bundle it to a final production build that you can upload to the web. If you use Parcel, you can run parcel build index.html dash dash public url dot in quotation marks. This will create a build in the dist folder that you can run in the browser. If you simply right-click this HTML file and open it in the browser, it will run. If you click the actual source code it uses, well, it's not something that's easy to read. 
This is because it bundled your source code together with all the libraries you use that minified the code. But in production, code readability is not important. What matters is that it runs, and it runs fast. So I hope that cleared up the tooling you can use for setting up a front-end project. If you still have questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe as I'm planning to come with new content. And don't forget to check out my earlier videos on web development and how to create games with JavaScript. See you at the next one.